Welcome back to our study, Growing Up Together. Today we begin the last section of our study, A Harvest for the Kingdom of God. Let's do a little bit of a review now. God plants the seed of truth in our hearts through his word. Then he waters the seed through the community of people around us. And then we begin to grow as we live out our faith in action, serving the church. When a seed reaches maturity, there will be a time of harvest as the seed multiplies into hundreds of new seeds. And in this section of our study, we will focus on what it means to be a worker in God's harvest fields. God wants to send each of us into the world to draw people to him. Now, at the beginning of the study, we defined a worldview as the lens through which we see the world. Today, let's take a look at this again and consider the implications of having or not having a biblical worldview. In Daniel chapter 3, the people of the land were commanded to bow down to King Nebuchadnezzar and his gods. Anyone who defied this command would be put to death. Would you worship the president or foreign gods to avoid death for yourself? Would you do it for your family? Well, these three brave Israelites refused to bow to these orders, literally, and were faced with a death sentence. Even in the face of death, these men did not waver, but they held fast to their faith and their worldview, affirming that God was able to save them even from death. Yet, they also recognized that he might not, but even so, they were unwilling to worship anyone or anything apart from God himself. And fortunately for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God chose to spare their lives even though they were thrown into the fiery furnace. For the rest of the story, you can check it out in Daniel chapter 3. Let's talk about the world's view. Everyone in the world has a world view. And it's formed starting the day we are born as we interact with our family, our friends, and with life itself. As we grow up, we learn about a love and about pain and about regret, about God, and about our, our purpose for being here. We figure out by observing others what normal is, and we generally conform with a desire to fit in. But the problem with this is that though it may be normal, it may not be right. Everybody may be doing it, but it might not be God's plan for us. You know, King Nebuchadnezzar believed that people should bow down to him. The soldiers believed that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would be burned to a crisp as a message to the world not to mess with the king. And many people probably thought that it would be okay to bow down to the king in order to spare their own lives or the lives of their family. But for three Israelites, it didn't matter what other people thought. They only cared about God's opinion. Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. God is our judge. His opinion matters infinitely more than anyone else's, and yet we still care about what other people think. Throughout the years, the American culture has been groomed to believe some things that are not true. Uh, in general, right or wrong, we've been groomed to believe that people are valued based upon the color of their skin. Uh, we value people based upon their nationality or ethnicity. Uh, we believe, some people believe that it's okay to live an alternative lifestyle. Or if I'm not hurting anyone else, then it must be okay. If everyone is doing it, then it must be okay. If she says yes, then it must be okay. And I deserve it because I work hard. Or the government should pay for things that I cannot afford. Or women are beautiful based upon their, their size and their shape. Or men should never show emotion. It's a sign of weakness. Or masculinity is measured by physical strength. Some people believe that intolerance is big, bigotry. Or money is the key to happiness. And if you aren't really busy, then you will never be successful. These are opinions. And they are the results of people establishing their values upon their personal desires. 
uh, the desire to feel good, to be happy, or to please others. Now, unfortunately, when we try to please ourselves and others, someone gets hurt. Someone has to pay for it, or someone will be offended, or it just leads to an end goal that is empty of meaning and fulfillment. Consider the life of Solomon. Now, he has been considered to be the wisest man who has ever lived and, and uh, authored the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, most scholars believe. Uh, Solomon had everything a person could ever want from this world. He had wealth. He had success in the eyes of the world. Uh, he had power. He had women, 700 wives and 300 concubines. And he had all of the toys that money could buy in that day. Now, you'd think that he would be the happiest guy on the planet. But do you know what he said about all of this earthly pleasure? He said it was all meaningless, vanity, like chasing after the wind. Because you'll never have enough money. You'll never get enough love. You'll never gain enough power. John D. Rockefeller, another person among the wealthiest of all time, was once asked how much money is enough. And his answer? Just a little bit more. That is the nature of our flesh because of sin. Now, and keep in mind that we all have a skewed perspective on the world that we live in. It's important to keep an attitude of humility so that we can recognize that our worldview uh, or worldview may need to, some adjustment. It's possible that we may be confronted with multiple differing views at the same time. If you were to ask 10 different people who God is, you might get 10 different answers. What we need is a standard view to live by. Let's talk about God's worldview. The world's worldview is rooted in self and is an abyss that will always lead to disappointment. But yet there is hope for fulfillment, however. But it can't be found in the perspective adopted by cultures throughout the world over the course of human history. You just can't find fulfillment in what this world has to offer. That's what Solomon was saying. Only God can bring the kind of fulfillment that we desire. So where do we go to get God's perspective? We go into his word. Psalm chapter 19, verses 9 through 11 says, The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. When I am obedient to the will of God, I find that I have peace in life, no matter how difficult it might seem. But when I try to live by my own pleasures, that's when I find that I mess everything up and, and I'm riddled with guilt and, and shame and regret and stress. God's plan is best. And hopefully you haven't needed to learn that the hard way. If God's plan is found in his word, then we need to be familiar with it. Read it, study it, memorize it, live it. We cannot emphasize this enough. If you want to know the word of God, there are no shortcuts. Read a little bit each day and never ever stop. It doesn't have to be much. Find a reading plan that works for you and a time that is convenient for your schedule. And it might also be helpful to do this with a friend who can encourage you along the way. Remember that accountability partner that we set you up with? But the Bible is full of wisdom that leads to uh, a healthy spirit and a life of joy. Hearing a sermon with a few verses on the weekend isn't enough to keep us strong. Let's talk about what the Bible says about a biblical worldview. A biblical worldview in a nutshell, is that God is the creator of all things and all glory belongs to him. He created mankind, unique and special within his creation, to have a relationship with us. We are loved dearly by him and he, he gives us the free will to choose to love him in return. And in this free will, we have chosen to love ourselves and have sinned against God. God's creation uh, has been subjected to sin and in is currently in a fallen and corrupt state. But one day, God will make everything new and all evil will be destroyed. God desires to redeem his children from their, 
their, their sinful nature through the blood of Jesus, who died in our place, taking the penalty of our sin upon himself. And those who receive this gift of salvation have the hope of eternal life in his presence. All others will suffer God's wrath and eternal condemnation. And so our purpose on this earth is to spread this message for the glory of God and for the benefit of those who will respond. And with this free will that we've been given, we can choose to love God as much or as little as we choose. He couldn't love us more and he wouldn't love us less. And our performance doesn't change the status of our salvation before him. He loves us unconditionally. Yet when we think about what we deserve because of our sin and what he has saved us from, the only appropriate response is a fully devoted heart motivated by a profound sense of gratitude. Now, perhaps this seems a bit idealistic to be fully devoted to God, but this is clearly his desire for us in passages like Deuteronomy 6.5 and Matthew 22.37, Mark 12.30, and Luke 10.27, which all remind us of God's command. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. In case you were wondering how much of our hearts God wants, he repeats it four times. He wants all of your heart. Even though the Bible is pretty clear that God desires us to be committed to him in obedience and faith, most of us find it a challenge to keep our hearts close to his. And, and part of it is that we have the sinful nature that pulls us away from God and we are selfish and we want to make our own decisions. And part of it might be that we look around us and we don't really see any good examples to follow. If everyone else is living for themselves, why shouldn't we? And another reason for our lack of commitment is that it is hard to remain steadfast for a lifetime when we are constantly facing trials and temptations and other obstacles that get in our way and distract us from the will of God. We lose a loved one and question if God cares. We lose our job and blame God for it. We get comfortable with our lifestyle and, and we don't make time for God. Maybe we faithfully attend church for a while, but we find it's easier to sleep in on weekends or just attend online for a while. When life gets us tired and drained and weak, we will want to justify the patterns that lead toward the path of least resistance. Whatever is easiest for us, that's, that's pretty normal. The Bible talks about denying yourself in order to keep on track. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. And that's Luke chapter 9. Now, we might be tempted to compare ourselves to the people around us, and perhaps we might feel like we are doing better than others in keeping God's will, but God does not grade on a curve. It's pass, fail. Jesus said, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Of course, we aren't perfect, and that is exactly why we need Jesus, because he was perfect. Instead of comparing our holiness to those around us, we need to remind ourselves that before God we are unholy apart from Christ. Once we recognize our need for Jesus, then we have a message to share with the world. God is looking for people who are fully devoted to use for his purposes. Are you willing to be one of those people? It may require us to make some personal sacrifices, and it will require you to trust in him, but he promises to reward those who are faithful to carry out his will. You know, as children of God seeking to have a biblical worldview, we must acknowledge that the world has a different worldview. That means we should not expect them to understand the way that God thinks. It should not surprise us that they live in disobedience to God. It may be willful disobedience, but it also may simply be ignorance. They don't know God's will. And so we should not shame them for not knowing better. 
for they are a product of the world that they live in. They need someone to show them the truth and to meet them with unconditional love on their level. The Apostle Paul said, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. So, uh, so as to win those not having the law, to the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this all for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. In another passage, Paul stands before a Greek audience that believes in the Roman pantheon of gods. And the, the Greeks are so concerned about not including any overlooked gods that they have a shrine labeled to an unknown god. And Paul meets them right at that level and proclaims to them about the god who was formerly unknown to them, telling them about what he has done for them in Christ. And that's what we need to do with our friends and our neighbors and our family and our co-workers. Instead of judging them for their sin, we need to meet them on their level of their worldview so that we can understand why they think what they think. Are they angry at God? Do they know about Jesus? Did they grow up in a home that looked down upon religion? Do they believe in any higher power at all? Maybe they think God is angry with them. What is at the heart of their worldview? You may also meet some people who call themselves Christians who clearly see differently than you. And though it is important to uphold the major doctrines of the faith, we need to allow for some grace in our differences. We major on the majors and seek to maintain unity within the church as much as possible. We are called to keep the unity in the church. Bringing this all together, we all have a worldview, and it is likely that everyone's worldview is off just a little bit, so we should be gracious to those who are different from us. It's so important for us to, to hold fast to the teachings of the Bible as a common standard for how we view this world that we live in, because it is God's revelation of himself that shows us how to live an obedient life. So we need to understand that a person's worldview is made up of their experiences, and it isn't that they are living in opposition to God necessarily. It may merely be ignorance, an unawareness of God's will. And God calls us to go into the world and to share the truth with them. And we can do this one person at a time. Before we pray, I just want to talk a little bit about our class assignments for this next six weeks. During the next six weeks, we will be writing out a simple testimony of what God has done in our lives. Then our goal is application. And there are many ways to share God's love, but we want to challenge you to communicate it through words and offer an invitation for people to come and to learn more about God at church. So let's set a goal of sharing your faith with three people over the next six weeks. That's one person every two weeks. For now, pray about who that would be and write down a list of names along with some specific prayer requests. For example, maybe God wants you to speak with Janice and you know that Janice is struggling with depression. Write her down on your list and start to pray for her. And whoever, whoever's on your list, start to pray for your list of people and ask God to show them their need for him. That's our class assignment for the next six weeks. I hope that you will join us in that challenge. And I'm excited to hear uh, the reports as they come in about how God is going to use this challenge in, in your life and in the lives of those around you. Let's go ahead and come before him in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these brothers and sisters as we look at this next study, um, bearing a, a harvest for your glory. God, would you give us courage as we look ahead to the class assignment, our group assignment, and as we encourage one another to share our faith with those around us. God, this is 
this is our desire that we might bear witness to your love and what you've done for us in our lives by forgiving us of our sins and inviting us to be in relationship with you for eternity. That's what we desire for those around us. And we know you love these people and you want us to reach out to them with your love. So give us courage, help us to encourage one another. And Lord, as we go into our discussion right now, I pray that your spirit would be at work in us. And uh, Lord, we just lift up our time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great discussion, and we'll see you again next week.